Hey, welcome to this week's session where we're going to discuss introduction to basic probability. Um, I know that it, um, in your module you don't deal with probabilities in that extent, but there are a couple of topics that or a couple of concepts that you need to be aware of and a couple of calculations that you need to be able to do as well. So we're going to I try and see if we can get you to that point where you are able to read the probability question and be able to answer that. So by the end of the session today, you should be able to learn the key concepts of probabilities, uh, when things are um, uh, events, the types of events that are there, like your mutually exclusive events, your complement events, your independent events, your simple and joint events, and so on. But also more specifically, in terms of calculation, you need to know when to apply the multiplicative rule and when to apply the addition rule as well. <clears throat> okay, so in terms of probabilities, we know that the probability is a, um, a term that is used for likelihood of events happening. So a probability can also be uh, described as a chance that a certain event will occur and it will always be between zero and one. So a probability, it's a numeric value, and you can represent it in a decimal format or in a percentage format. So in a decimal format, it's between zero and one. So it can never be a value in a negative or it can never be a value bigger than one. Uh, if we represent it as a percentage, it's also it's zero and 100%. So it can never be any value in the negative percentage and it can never be any value greater than 100%. When an event is certain to happen, for example, the sun coming up, that event, we call it a certain event, and it's always going to have a probability of one. An uncertain event or an impossible event is that impossible, um, is that event that has no chance of happening, and that always have a, a probability of zero. Now, when we assess probabilities as well, there are three different types of probability, the three different ways that we can assess probabilities. Um, we can use the priori, which is the likelihood of an event occurring when there is a finite amount of outcomes that exist. And we always use this in most cases that um, the probabilities that you're going to be working with in this module are always the priori. Um, uh, 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 are always use the uh, they always use the priori mm -hmm. approach, and the probability that something will happen in priori, it's the number satisfying that event or that event divided by the total number of outcomes. And we also have an empirical probability, which refers to a likelihood of an event occurring based on historical data. Uh, also, the probability of occurrence for that empirical probability uh, is the number satisfying that event divided by the total number of outcomes. And both the priori and the empirical probability are also what we call classical probabilities, because these are most often those probabilities, the, the way we approach probability concepts or the way we do probabilities, we use either the priori or empirical probabilities. And then the third one is a subjective probability. This one is based on the researcher's opinions. It's a combination of individual past experience, personal opinion, analysis, and, and particular situation. So this one, you use mixed method type of a, a way of assessing your probabilities because that you also have to put yourself in it, uh, your opinion, your prior knowledge, or your uh, the way you view things. Okay, so we spoke about number satisfying an event and the total outcome and so on. What are these events? So, for example, an event will be a process of something happening. That is an event. You create an event. So, each event uh, has a possible outcome that comes out of it. For example, if I toss a coin, a coin has two outcomes that it can land on. It can either land on a head or it can land on a tail. 
if I roll a die, which I'm creating an event of rolling a die, and a die can will have the outcome one, two, three, four, five, and six because it's got six sides. Uh, those are what we call possible event. And we can define each event in terms of whether what kind of an event is that? Is it happening on its own? Or is it happening and it has other things around it as well, happening with others? For example, we do have what we call a simple event. It's just one event. A simple event describes a single characteristic, which that single, so that one I cut. So a single event will be the probability, oh, sorry, an event that a, a coin will land on a head. That is one event. Landing on a head is one. Or all, all students registered in a particular module. That's single event. We also have joint events where things happen together. So for example, when you uh, when you have two characteristics that define that. So a person who registered in a psych 3704 and is a male or a female. Those are two events coming from two different characteristics. One is the module and the other is the gender. Both of them happening at the same time. Those we call them joint event and they are represented by an end and to combine the two events. Then we also have what we call a complement event. And a complement event will be the event that is included, but not in the original event that you are looking at. For example, if I'm taking an example of a coin and I say I'm creating this event of tossing the of tossing the coin and it must land on a head, a head is the probability, is the event that I'm looking at. The complement of the of the head would be the other outcome that is also included, which is the tail. So a head, the complement of a head, it's a tail. A tail, a complement of a tail, it's a head. And we always denote a complement by using um, letters like a complement with a copy, or a copy, or a complement, or not there, it must be subscript, superscript a complement and so on. You can denote your complement event as such. Okay, so when we have a total of all collect, um, collection of all outcomes, all those outcomes are called what, uh, are what we call a sample space. So for example, all sides of a dice create what we call a sample space. Those are the total outcomes. Um, a coin total outcome will be all the sides of that coin. Um, total outcome will be all number of students registered for psych. That will be the total outcome plus other characteristics that they have. But it will be the total outcome will be made up of all students registered for uh, modules in a program. Let's say it's BCom degree or a, a BA degree in in industrial psychology, let's say that is the, the, the cost. So all students registered for that program, they do different modules. So we need all of them, all those modules, they compose, uh, when we combine all of them, they create what we call a sample space. Okay, so we can visualize uh, probabilities and events or if mostly events, we can visualize them to make sense of them as they happen. And we can use what we call a Venn diagram. And with a Venn diagram, it creates a joint event, single event of all possible outcomes that we have. Or we can visualize them in terms of a decision tree, which branches off. Uh, it starts with the whole or the total outcomes, and then you start branching out to say, if I, um, I look at how many students are doing psych, or other subject, and then those who are doing psych, we can look at their gender and look at whether how many are doing, how many are female, how many are male, and from those ones we can also look at other characteristics. How many are, um, uh, how in terms of race, how many are black, colored, white, Indian, and so on. So you can start br branching it out 
in terms of that to look at the possible outcome. So if we look at the coin, a coin has two sides. So if I toss the coin, uh, uh, the first coin, the coin will land on a head and a tail. If I toss um, uh, that coin again, if it first landed on a head, and now it can either, when I toss it the second time, it can either land on a head or a tail, and you can continue with that to create couple, uh, different scenarios as well. Um, and you can use this to create your scenarios and answer the probability questions based on that. And we can use some of these examples when we look at the, the exercises as well. You can also use a contingency table, which makes it easy for you to visualize events, especially where you have joint events and a simple event and you want to make use of a contingency table. So there's nothing stopping you from using also a decision tree, but for me, contingency table, it's much easier to use and interpret. Okay, so from a simple event, we can calculate a simple probability by using observation satisfying that event of a simple event divided by the sample space or the total outcome, all right? So let's say, for example, this is our data or of events happening. So we've got gender and the module registered. So if I want to calculate the probability that a student is registered in an STA 1610, then regardless of what kind of agenda they are, I'm using simple event. It means I'm only looking at the module. There are eight of them and the total outcome is the sum of all the other values that are there, which is your sample space. There are 20 outcomes, so I'll take eight divided by 20 and I get 0, 0,4. If I need to calculate the probability of a mail because um, these students are registered in different modules, I'm disregarding that. I'm only interested in the probability of a simple event mail, regardless of which module they are in the total outcome satisfying that simple event, there are five, and I divide them by 20 to get my simple event, probability of my simple event, mail. And you can do it for any other question that you want to answer, uh, especially if you're only interested in simple events. So you need to be able to recognize that this question is asking you to calculate a simple event or it asking you to calculate the joint event. So in terms of joint events, these are events that happens at the same time. So it comes from, uh, to calculate the joint probability, you, you will calculate it from a joint event. So two events happening at the same time, two or more. It can be more actually. So that is also given by number satisfying that joint event divided by the sample space or the grand total or the total outcome. Looking at the same example, so where do we see joint events? STA 1610 and female, there are seven of them. So it means students registered for STA 710, uh, 1610 and they are female there are seven of them. Those are joint events. So this is where you calculate your joint events. So let's see if we calculate a probability of a male and statistic uh, STA 1610. So a male STA 1610 event satisfying is one. There is only one male doing STA 1610. And out of 20 people that are registered for this program, and we say one divided by 20, and that gives us the probability. And that is the joint event. Marginal events, I'm not going to touch on the marginal events. It's just the addition of, it, um, of the joint events to create a simple event as well. So I'm not going to touch on that. Then we also have what we call mutually exclusive events. And mutually exclusive events are events that happen simultaneously. Or at this, oh, sorry. Mutually exclusive events are events that cannot happen at the same time. They cannot exist at the same time. So it means usually this refers to joint events. And we know that the probability of a joint event is number satisfying that event um, divided by the sample space. But for mutually exclusive events, for example, if I need to choose a random student registered. Uh, for a program and 
um, I choose a student from Psych 3704 and Psych from uh, QM and student from QMI 1501. If on that data set, all of them, it's individual students, they don't do repeat courses, they all do different courses. Uh, so student A is from Psych 3704, student in QMI 1501. Both of them cannot happen at the same time because you cannot be in Psych and be also in QMI at the same time you will be in one. So these are what we call the mutually exclusive event and the probability of A and B. And you will notice that I use not an end end, but I use the intersection end, or you can use the end. It means the same thing, and B. So if I need to calculate this probability, the probability of A and B, that probability will be equals to zero. That is mutually exclusive event. Collectively exhaustive events, these are events that complete the sample space. One of the events must occur, but they also need to cover the entire sample space. So remember, in, in on a coin, there is a head and a tail. So for them to be mutually exclusive, head and a tail needs to happen some way, somehow in that. So let's assume that we randomly choose a day in 2014, a day A representing all the weekdays, B representing days that falls on a weekend, and C representing days that falls in January, and D represents uh, days that falls in spring. Weekday and weekend, and January and spring, they all create a collectively exhaustive event because they all include all the days of the calendar, right? But they are not mutually exclusive. And weekday can also be in January and can also be in spring and a weekend as well. So if you think about it, collectively exhaustive means all of them together, right? They complete the sample space, but they can also still not be mutually exclusive because mutually exclusive events are events that cannot happen at the same time. So A and B are mutually exclusive because a, a day in weekday cannot be a day on a weekend, right? So A and B on their own as well, they are also collectively exhaustive. So what have we done so far? Up to now, we learned that we can calculate from a, using a contingency table, we can calculate the joint probabilities and we can calculate the simple probabilities. And so far, what we learned was the probability is a numerical value and it measures the likelihood of an event happening, right? And we learned that the probability has a value between zero and one inclusive because it, it can either be zero for an impossible event or one for a certain event. <clears throat> the sum now, this, you need to also know and remember that the sum of all events or the sum of all probabilities should always be equal to one. And if and only if A and B are mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive, then the sum of all of them would always be equals to one. The other thing <clears throat> we also learned is the complement event A is defined to be an event consisting of all possible points that are not included in that original event A. So we get, <clears throat> we can use the formula if we want to find the probability of A and we want to find the complement of it, we can use one minus the probability of the complement, or we can find the complement event, the probability of A complement will be given by one minus the probability of that event. They will all give you the same. So if I've got a complement, I can calculate the probability of the event, or if I have the probability of an event, I can calculate the complement and you're going to learn all those things. Then we also have what we call probability rules. And one of them is calculating the event that either or the two of them happening at the same time. So 
if I need to calculate the probability of A or B, which can also be denoted by the probability of A union B, you can, we can either use the two. It's given by the probability of the joint or the simple probability of A plus the probability of B minus the joint probability of A and B. Only if and only if A and B are mutually exclusive, then the probability of A and B is equal to zero because we've learned that, that the probability of A and B, the joint probability of A and B, if it's equals to zero, therefore it means the events are mutually exclusive. So only and only if A and B are mutually exclusive, then <clears throat> the addition rule states that the probability of A or B, the probability of either A or event B will be given by the probability of A plus the probability of B. That is only if they are mutually exclusive. We also have what we call conditional probabilities, and these are probabilities of one event given that another event has occurred. And that is given by the probability of an event A, given that the probability of B has already happened, is given by the joint probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. And you can write it vice versa as well. When events are independent, then the conditional probability states that because of the two events being independent of each other, it means one event does not have any influence on the other one happening. So when one happens, it does not affect how the other one is happening. So two events are independent if and only if the probability of a conditional probability of A given B will be given by the probability of A because B has no effect on what A is going to be. And we can do the same. So this one is a repeat of that. Even A and B are independent when the probability of one event is not affected by the fact that the other event has already occurred. And that is independent. So then how do we then find the joint probability of A and B? if we've got independent events. So, and that's when we introduce what we call a multiplicative rule or multiplication rule for two events. So, when two events are independent, we know that the probability of A given B from the conditional probability, let's put it this way. We know that the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. This is for normal probabilities. Now, if I need, if I'm given the conditional probability and then I'm given the simple probability, I can then, in a mathematical format, we say we cross multiply. In order for us to remove the probability of B, this side we're going to multiply by the probability of B. Whatever you do on one side, you must also do on the other side. Therefore, this one will cancel out and you will be left with the probability of A and B is equals to, I'm going to start with this one first, the probability of A given B times the probability of B. As you can see there, that is what we call a multiplicative rule. That's where it comes from. However, if we're dealing with independent events now, if we're dealing with independent events, we learn that the probability of A given B is equals to the probability of A. Now, for independent events, and if and only if A and B are independent, then the probability of A and B will be given by the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B because we're going to replace the conditional probability with the probability of A because the conditional probability of A given B for independent events is equals to the probability of A because B has no effect or does not affect the outcome of the probability of A. Okay, so we've learned the multiplicative rules. Now, let's do more examples. But before that, in summary, 
just to conclude as well. Independent events, remember, is when occurrence of an event has no effect on the probability of the other event happening. Mutually exclusive event is when occurrence of one event precludes the occurrence of another. Or we can also say mutually exclusive event is when two events can never happen at the same time or cannot happen at the same time. Exhaustive events are a set of all events representing all possible outcomes of a sample space. Then, addition rule is when events, oh, addition rule occurs when events are mutually exclusive. So, you must ask yourself, are events mutually exclusive and am I calculating an event of either or? Then I'm going to apply the additive rule. The law of conjunction deals with independence. So it means you're going to ask yourself this one. Am I dealing with conditional probabilities here? Does event A and B, uh, is event A and B independent from one another? Or are these two events independent from one another? So when they are, then we're going to use, especially for joint events, we're going to use the multiplicative rule because the probability of A is equal to the probability of A. Time. The probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A plus the uh, times the probability of B. Always remember that. Okay, so let's look at activities. Uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna do the activities with you. Um, We will do them together. So let's see. In the population, there are 450 people of whom 150 smoke. What is the probability of randomly selecting a non-smoker? So if this is our sample space N, and if this is our X, and if non-smoker is X complement, or oh, let's not make it an X, then. let's make them A and B. A and non-smoker is A complement. So we need to calculate the probability of an A complement, right? We are told we can calculate the probability of A, which is your X divided by N, which our uh, X is 150 events satisfying, which is the smoking, divided by 450. And that gives us 150 divided by 450, 0 0.33. 0 0.33. Therefore, to calculate the probability of A complement, which is non-smoker, is 1 minus the probability of the event. So which is 1 minus 0, 0,33, which is 0, 0,67, which will be option one. That's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is, I know that there are 450, 150 are smoking, Therefore, A complement will be 450 minus 150. And that will leave me with 450 minus 150 leaves me with 300. So in order for me to calculate the probability of non-smoker, or, or I can say it's the probability of A complement because I use the A's, I'm going to use 300 divide by 450 and 300 divided by 450 is equals to 0 0.67. So you have two ways that you can use based on how we answered the question. So you can either answer it using the probability concepts or you can just go ahead and calculate the event and just do that. Easy, easy. Yeah. Moving on to question number two. Which of the following does not represent a probability? A, 
in your module, I think they expect you to use probability in a decimal format. And you will use proportions in a percentage format. So which one does not represent a probability in this instance? It will be option number one, which is in a percentage. So proportion will be percentage probabilities will be decimal. Okay, question number three. If 10,000 students who were university, who wrote a university admission test, 7,000 passed, it means they obtained 50% or more. So it means it's they got greater than or equals to 50%. So it includes 50%. And 400 only obtained uh, exactly 50%. So out of this 7,400 got 50. So what is the probability of a randomly selected student will fail a test? Now, this is just to confuse you. Read the question carefully and make a decision from there and say which statement is relevant to answer this question and which statement is not. So let's start with that. We have our sample space and we have our event A and we also have our joint event. Oh, I'm not going to say it's joint event because this is exactly, I can, I, I, I can call them B as well of five of exactly. So B is equals to five, uh, 50, uh, 400, and it is also included in this. So now, what is the probability of a randomly selected student would fail? What does fail mean? Fail means a student would have received less than 50%. So if I have greater than or equals to 50%, then I've got my entire of those ones. So the rest, means they failed. So 70, uh, 7,000 passed, the rest from 10,000 failed. So our B fail, or oh, I'm gonna use, um, this was for this one, the B there. And I'm gonna use A complement with this one. So A complement is, 10,000 minus 7,000 is 3,000. So 3,000 of the students failed. So in order to calculate the probability of a fail, we're going to say 3,000 divided by 10,000. And the answer is, The answer is 0 0.3. And it's none of those ones that are over there. because they are looking for the probability of those who have failed the test. And to fail the test, they would have received less than 50. Unless if they say uh, they obtained 50% or more, would mean it does not include the 50. Let me just see if I don't include from the 3,000. If I subtract also the 400, you get 26,000 divided by 10,000, but this is very wrong, it's 26%, so it's not. So I think one of the options here is written wrong. Maybe probably I'm gonna assume that this one was 0 0.3. Okay, let's look at exercise four. A probability of an event occurring which depends on 
something else occurring, such as passing a test when you do not understand your course, can be described as what is the probability of an event happening given that another event has happened? Is it one conditional probability, two independent events, three mutually exclusive events, four multiplicative? Independent event describes the event. Here we're talking about the probability. Mutually exclusive event describes the event. It's not a probability. Multi multiplicative probability, we've never spoken about such thing. We know that this should be multiplicative law not probability, so the only one that is outstanding is just the conditional probability. And we remember, conditional probability is probability given that another event has happened. The formula, we write it that way, right? And that is the definition of a conditional probability. Let's look at exercise five. Uh, yo, and I, you must let me know if I'm going too fast. Let me just ask you to answer this one so that then it doesn't mean like I'm giving you all the answers. A ball is drawn at random from a box containing six balls, white, uh, four, uh, six red balls, four white balls, five blue balls. What is the probability that it is red? So remember, to always calculate your sample space and, and your sample space N will be a total of all outcomes. All outcomes is this is all of the balls. So there are six plus four. Six plus four plus five, which is equals to fifteen. That is your sample space. So calculate the probability of red. That will be outcome satisfying red divide by n. How many balls are red? Divide by the total sample space. What is the answer? Are you still there? So the answer would be uh, observation satisfying red. There are six of them. The sample oh, space okay. is 15. And what is the answer? Six divided by, by 15 is 0 0.4. And we can just add zero zeros because they put your answers in three decimal. You can just add the other zeros because it doesn't change the number. Okay. Let's look at another one. The probability that Jamie will pass his research methodology exam is 0 0.5. Find the probability that they will fail. Probability of fail is given by one minus the probability of pass. So they have given you the probability already. So they told you that this is a probability. Always remember one, two, three, hundred, sixteen, twenty, ten thousand. These are what we call events. If it's 0 0.1, 0 0.30, 0 0.5, 0 0.78, these are what we call probabilities. With an exception of one. So one can either be an event and can also be a probability. Always remember, if they give you the event, you calculate the probability. If they give you the probability, you just substitute. So this will be one minus 0, 0,53. And the answer is 
zero comma four seven, which is option four. Which is option four. Okay, now we go into interesting stuff. If a coin is flipped three times, the sample space of all possible outcomes would be. So now you can, in this instance, you can use a decision, a decision tree because they say a coin is flipped three times. So we're going to create three, three, three ways. So we start at the beginning and we branch out. So it was a head and a tail. And at that point, we call this coin. So this is this is the first time, right? The second time, it creates a head. Let me write on the. I'm gonna do it like that. So we toss one time, two times, it lands on a head and a tail, a head and a tail. So those will be our three, a head and a tail, a head and a tail, a head and a tail, even though they are not that visible. So this one is head, 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 Head. This one, it's head, head, tail, head, head, tail. And this one and that one, I'm going to do all of them like that. I'm going to have all the outcomes. So this one is head, tail, and a head, head, tail, and a head. And this one is head, tail, tail, head. Tail, tail. And this one is tail. Oh, I forgot to put head and tail on this. Tail, head, head. Tail, head, head. And this is he um, tail, head, tail. Tail, head, tail. And this one is tail, tail, head. Tail, tail, head. And this is tail, tail, tail. Tail, tail, tail. And those are the three possible outcomes. So let's see. Head, head, head. Head, head, tail. Head, head, head. Head, head, tail. Head, tail, head. Head, tail, head. Head, tail, tail. Head, tail, tail. Head, uh, tail. Tail, head, head. Tail, head, head. Tail, head. Tail, tail, head, tail, 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 head, tail, tail, head, and tail, 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 and tail, tail. You see how easy it is to find your your outcomes. Uh, if I look at the other ones, they could also be, but they might be repeating themselves. Um, head, 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 tail, head, tail, tail. Head, tail, head, tail, tail, head, head, tail, tail. It's repeating. This one is repeating. So it cannot be that one. So the others, they are missing other things. So you can see. So let's do the last one. Oh, this is the second last. Then you flipped four unbalanced or well balanced coin. What are the odds that? Um, two of the coins will lead, will land heads up. So also you can create a decision tree on this one so that then it helps. So it means I'm ha I have to draw a big one now. So we start at the beginning and it lands on a head and a tail. And we're going to split. Two and that's one, two, three, and this will be the last one. 
need to do the same with this one. It has to split twice. And I'm going to run out of space. It has to split twice and it also has to split again. And the same on this one, it has to split and it has to split and it has to split again. Okay, so we always start with the head. So it's head, uh, head, tail. And on this one, head, tail. And on this one, head, tail. And we do the same. Head, tail, head, tail, head, tail, head, tail, head, tail, head, tail, head, tail. And I'm going to also do the same head, tail, head, tail, head, tail. So I've created all those scenarios. So one, two. I'm doing it this way so that I know that I don't skip anyone. I include. Mm, I'm going to run out of. Space. Yeah. So the first one is head, 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 head. That line. It's head, 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 head. This one, head, 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 tail. Head, 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 tail. The next one, it's head, head, tail. Head, 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 tail. Head. The next one, head, head, tail, tail. The next one, head, tail. Didn't put the head, tail. Uh, the next one is head, tail, head, head. The next one, head, tail, head, tail, head. Tail, head, tail. The next one, head, tail, tail, head. Head, tail, tail, head. Head, tail, tail, head. Head, tail, tail, uh, tail. Sorry, that's another tail. The next one, head, tail, head, head, head. Tail, Head, head, head. Tail, head, head, tail. Tail, head, head, tail. Tail, head, tail. Tail, head, tail, head. Tail, head, tail, tail. Tail. Tail, head, head, tail, tail, head, tail, 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 head, tail, 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 tail. So I've got all scenarios. So now, what are the odds of that two coins? So we'll land on a head. So we need to find where there are two heads. Let's change the pen color. I know that we, oh, sorry. That is the last one. I just want to go in here and change my pointer color. So we want to find where we've got only two heads in the one. Head, head, head. There are three, two. Two, there are three, two, 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 and those are the ones. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Six. Two. Two heads coin. 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. 16 is our total outcome. So 6 divided by 16. 6 divided by 16, which is the probability. Uh, if we're going to call this A, I'm always labeling my events A, 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 which is 0, 0,375, which is option 3. That's how easy it is or how tricky it can be to answer questions on probabilities. And that concludes today's session. And like always, we from Pambili Analytics, where we're trying to bridge the gap in terms of numeracy and um, statistical literacy and data literacy skills. We offer a range of suite of services uh, with skills development as one of our flagship. Uh, we're still running a special of 150 per hour for this until the end of this month, and then we go back to our normal rate. If you want to access the recordings, we do have previous recordings that are free. You can watch them as many times as you want. Remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel, to like our videos, share our videos, or share, share our channel so that as many people can get empowered as well. If you want to receive recordings of these sessions, you have to uh, either sign in or join a membership. Only these three types, levels of membership gives you access to the recording as well as the notes. Thank you for coming today. If you want to contact us, here are our contact details. You can send us an email or you can catch us on WhatsApp. Thank you for coming through. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Thank you. You too. Bye.